Hello everyone, I'm Lex Chase, and as a send-off from here at Sinfully Sexy Book Reviews, Mackie asked me to do a reading from Americana Fairy Tale, book one of Fairy Tales of the Open Road. So to set this little thing up a bit is Taylor, our fairy tale princess dude, and Corentin, our huntsman guy, are joined by Ringo, uh, Taylor's fairy godfather, as they got their little quest underway, and they are now stopping for the night at the Wigwam Motel in Holbrook, Arizona. It is a real legit place, and you honestly, honest to God, need to check it out. It is fantastic and amazing and so full of wrong. So, on the way, uh, Taylor had actually had a wet dream in the truck. So, and, you know, boy stuff happened. So it's all, like, really super awkward between them right now. Yeah. So here we are, and this is how we do it. I'm getting in the shower, Taylor said, and quickly shuffled in the bathroom. In the silence, Taylor pressed his back to the door and slid to the floor. He clamped both hands around the crotch of his shorts and hissed through clenched teeth. Stop, stop, stop. Please stop. He had to stop thinking about his dream and thinking about Crenton in that way. Crenton wasn't even his type. And Crenton's type was clearly not a raging homosexual. By all of Taylor's understanding, Crenton's breed of redneck was a misogynistic racist variety. Taylor paused. Was he just telling himself that? Was Taylor mentally felt around the edges of his dream. He flinched with a dirty feeling. Shower. He needed a shower. Now. He picked himself up off the floor and staggered to the tub. The enamel had seen better days with that lovely rusty ring around it. The shower curtain seemed to be a repository for all sorted natures of DNA. Taylor gingerly touched it in an effort to move, move it just out of the way, enough to turn on the faucet. Scuffed up and mottled with rust, even the faucet made him wince. He ripped off a sheaf of cheap toilet paper in an effort to turn the faucet on. The water belched into the tub, and after a few rude bur bubbling gurgles, it ran a steady stream. It wasn't particularly warm, however. Taylor surmised he didn't really need a warm shower anyway. He disrobed, dropping his clothes in a heap on the floor. But on second consideration, he didn't have anything else to change into. What he had in his back was it, like his cum-stained cargo shorts. Yuck! He scooped his clothes off the floor and hung his shirt on the towel rack. He'd have to do something about his shorts because they'd smell and get uncomfortably crusty. He chuckled. He would never have predicted how conscientious he'd become about cleanliness until he only had one change of clothes for the foreseeable future. As the tub faucet ran to get to some marshable level of lukewarm, he cranked the faucet in the sink. He let the water run over the crotch of his new shorts and scrubbed them as best he could with the questionable crack so far. Crenton knocked once on the door. Come on, man. Gotta pee. Hold your horses, Taylor huffed. Let me get in the shower first. Great storyteller almighty. Taylor hustled and wrung out his shorts. He hung them also on the towel rack and finally hopped in the shower before poor pitiful Crenton could have an accident on the floor. Some self-reliant huntsman he was. Could he go out back and piss on some tree? Of course, there would likely need to be some nature of tree on the premises. Taylor jerked the curtain across the tub for privacy and instantly regretted taking a fistful of it in such haste. Okay, it's safe. Her princesses were prissy, but I know it applied to male princesses, Crenton said as he walked in. Taylor could see the outline of his body through the haze of the shower curtain. He pushed himself back against the far wall to gain some distance. A small gap remained between the curtain and the shower wall, and he carefully peeked. The familiar clanking of a belt buckle, followed by a zipper, Taylor instead sent his gaze upward to Crenton's face and his bare shoulders. Crenton had done away with his shirt, and Taylor's face heated with the view. Crenton was lean like a panther, and his tattooed skin pulled tight over his biceps and hard abs. He finished, flushed, and then turned away to zip his pants. Taylor pressed his fingers to his lips at the sight of the rise of Crenton's tight rear. He shifted the sink and washed his hands. 
He steadied himself in the mirror while Taylor stared through the shower curtain. Crichton swung open the door and called behind him. Don't use all the hot water. Uh, okay. Taylor croaked, his face hot from gawking. The door shut with a click, and Taylor sighed with relief. He looked down at himself in disappointment. He was filthy from dirt, sweat, and whatever else was lurking in Crichton's disgusting truck. He turned, reaching for the cracked soap bar. The blocking grooves in the soap made him reconsider. He reached for the mini Johnson & Johnson shampoo bottle and uncapped it. After a careful sniff, he tried to make sure it wasn't rancid and questioned if it was possible for shampoo to go rancid. Figuring he would chance it, he scrubbed himself down with the terrible No More Tears formula. He breathed one more time, trying to cope with the lukewarm water, and then decided it was time to face the reality of a nasty motel room with a man he didn't trust who made him blush. He shut up the water and carefully maneuvered out of the shower without touching the petri dish that served as a curtain. Taylor considered his clothes. His shirt could use some airing out, and his shorts were a definite no. His only option was a towel around his waist. He didn't even like that option in high school, let alone the middle of nowhere with the current company. Ringo was there, though. That made it better. Ringo would save him. Covering himself, Taylor took a breath, and on the mental count of three, he turned the doorknob, and the chill of the overward window unit hit him square in the chest. Fuck! Taylor gasped and scuttled to the bed. He immediately wrapped himself in the threadbare blanket, which didn't help at all. He had a string of curses on his tongue when he finally glanced up and saw Corentin. More specifically, he saw Corentin's tattooed torso. Corentin, on the other hand, busied himself with making notes in his monstrosity of a book. His brow would furrow every time we underlined something in a determined gesture across the page. He seemed not to notice Taylor's open staring at the intricate black ink of the oak tree, drawn in the style of Gustav Dorr. The trunk of the tree was a full sleeve with the roots growing out of Crenton's left wrist, and at the shoulder, the branches twisted in a wind-blown manner across his collarbone, shoulder blade, and a few even curled at the base of his neck. Taylor swallowed. At least it explained why he was so covered up for the June weather. But something was strange about the tattoo. There were seven boughs, and only one had leaves. Quentin kept making notes, but didn't look up. His brow furred into an even angrier contortion as he wrote faster. When he apparently ran out of space, he flipped his book to sit horizontally and wrote in tiny print in the margins. He hesitated, tapping his pen on the paper. Taylor pulled his blanket higher on his shoulder. The steam of his body captured under the blanket helped making the chill of the room more bearable. Crichton scribbled again in his book. He frowned and scribbled in a repeated gesture. He flicked his pen with a wrist. He tired again. He grunted and threw the pen. Fuck, he said and went fishing for his messenger bag. He feverishly reached around, looked in, and then reached around again. He puffed a sigh and upturned the bag under the carpet. A palm-sized bottle of liquid tumbled out and bounced across the floor and Crichton scrambled to snatch it in mid-tumble. He glanced at Taylor and offered a smile. Hand sanitizer. Can't go anywhere without it. He quickly shoved the bottle in the side pocket of his bag. Taylor said nothing, merely watching the bizarre display as Crichton poked through crumbled receipts, hair ties, old cracker apples, various unidentifiable crumbs, and wadded up trash. He also flipped through a collection of condoms with shiny magenta wrappers, imprinted with hearts and lips. Taylor tightened his grip on his comforter, and his face heated. Well, at least they were cherry-flavored or something? Crichton shook out the bag again, and Taylor remained silent. As a roll of duct tape tumbled out, and then zip ties. Taylor's eyes snapped wide, and Crichton had fucking huntsman death tools on him at all times. He shivered and scooted back on the bed. He judged the distance from the bed to the door in case he needed to, to run at a moment's notice. Obviously, a naked guy running down the interstate would get some attention, but he hadn't seen any cars on the interstate since they ended up here. He nibbled at his bottom lip. Maybe if he stole Crenton's truck? Seemed like a good idea. Ah! Crenton said, clearly relieved he had apparently found a pen, and ignored the zip ties and the duct tape. He resumed his furious scribbling. Taylor finally took a moment to speak up. 
He tried not to draw attention to the damning evidence on the floor. I've never heard of a huntsman who was a storyteller, too. Crenton held up a finger, indicating Taylor should wait. Taylor pressed his lips together as Crenton read through his notes silently. He ran his fingers over his handwriting, mouthing the words. He nodded once and pressed the mishmash of the monster's book together and secured it with the bungee cord. He took a breath, leaning back on the rickety chair. It's complicated, Crenton said. Taylor nodded slowly, beckoning for Crenton to continue, for Crenton didn't explain further than that. Taylor took the initiative. Um... Taylor tilted his head to indicate the zip ties and the duct tape. I gotta be honest, those are kind of freaking me out. Crenton sighed and held the monster's journal against his chest. It's what I do, you know. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to use them, I promise. Taylor nodded slowly, forcing himself to trust Corentin while every fiber of his being screamed not to. Ringo was with him. Ringo would protect him. Okay, this is okay. Corentin sat in the strange tome on the desk, and the desk wobbled under the weight of it. He nudged the book in flush alignment with the desk's edge. There seemed to be some small ceremonial gesture in doing so. Taylor noticed a quiet reverence on Corentin's face. He turned toward Taylor, and Taylor's gut clenched. Something was coming. Scoot over, Corentin said with a smile. Taylor stared in, hor in horror. There's no room. Corentin frowned and gestured to the carpet. Do you see any room to sleep on the floor? He said in a tone that Taylor did not appreciate. Taylor stood his ground. Corentin was not getting the bed with him. No way, no how, especially not with him naked. Especially not with Crenton being the huntsman who may or may not kill him. Taylor still didn't quite believe that Crenton had no intentions. Yeah, and Big, Wolf had, Big Bad Wolf had no intention of raping Little Red either. Porn stars get creative, Taylor said. You can too. Why are you so difficult all the time, Crenton asked with a tone of frustration. We can share the bed. It's no big deal. Taylor's heart hammered, and he wondered if this was how it happened for girls. Hearing it was no big deal, and the second they let their guard down is where it all went wrong. He took several deep breaths, considering his options. Ringo wouldn't let anything bad happen to him. Sure, Ringo had been next to no help in this whole mess, but if he couldn't fully trust Corentin, he could trust Ringo. Uh, okay he said slowly, and shifted the small double bed for mending Crenton room. Crenton sat on the edge and kicked up his boots. His jeans stayed on, but his unusual tattoo was bare for all to see. Crenton reclined onto his back and wiggled his toes. So far, nothing seemed out of place. You know, the TV may smell funny, and the carpet's damp, but the bed's not bad, Crenton said. Uh-huh, uh-huh, was all Taylor could manage as he stayed still as possible. How about some covers? Crenton said, reaching over. No! Taylor barked and pulled the blanket tighter to him. Crenton hesitated. Sorry? I, um, uh, Taylor stammered and finally confessed. I'm naked. Oh? Taylor, Crenton said. It's clear he wasn't getting it. The princess thing? Taylor said. It can't be seen in an inappropriate state? Crenton brightened. Oh! He said, and stood, then paced to the chair where his jacket hung. Do you want my flannel? He asked, pulling it from the folds of his jacket. It's pretty big on me anyway. It might be long enough to... Corentin stopped before saying anything else. Taylor knew something else was coming. It was quite perplexing that Corentin seemed a little flustered about it. Corentin held out a flannel shirt to Taylor, and he accepted the red plaid fabric. They nodded to each other, and Corentin unexpectedly turned around and covered his eyes. Go on, he said. Put it on. I won't look. Taylor couldn't help the blush creeping across his features at Crenton's generosity. Not wasting any time, he hopped from the bed, let the towel drop, and tossed on the shirt and hurriedly buttoned it. A little big on Crenton was right. A tent on Taylor was more true to the fact. The damn thing went down to his knees, and the sleeves went well past his wrists. Uh, okay, Taylor said. I'm good. Crenton turned to Taylor as he was rearranging the bedding. Taylor glanced up from fluffing the pillows and noticed Crenton had a peculiar, almost dumbfounded expression. Was he blushing? Taylor's brow furrowed. He shook his head. He was so seeing things. 
That's all it was. Or another stupid dream. He had to be asleep right now. No way the subtle flirting was going on. Taylor took control and hopped in the bed. You take that side, I'll take this one, he said, and rolled over to face the concave wall away from Corentin. He gritted his teeth. You're turning your back on him, you idiot, he cursed himself. He grunted and rolled over the exact moment Corentin settled in the bed. Oddly enough, Corentin turned away from him, and Taylor puffed a sigh of relief. Corentin's chest rose and fell with a long breath as they lay in the silence for several minutes. On the pillow, just above Taylor's head, Ringo croaked an obnoxious snore of someone so small. Taylor snorted, trying to hold in a laugh. Quentin stiff, stiffened, trying to do the same. Both of them spit giggles, trying not to wake him up. Quentin reached out to the end table and clicked off the light. In the darkness, he shifted in the bed, and Taylor froze. He braced. Sure, this was the moment. Quentin was going to make his move. Instead, Quentin fluffed his pillow. Confusion washed over Taylor, but he decided to let it be. Hey, Crenton said into the blackened teepee. Y yeah? Taylor said and regretted how it came out like a squeak. This is really important, Crenton said. In the morning, you need to tell me to turn the blue tab in my book. First thing. Got it? Uh, I guess? Taylor said and Crent to Crenton's back. He had no idea what his creepy book had to do with anything. Promise me, Quentin said sternly. Promise me, no matter what, you'll make, you'll make sure I read it. Taylor didn't like where this was going. Should I be sleeping? He asked. It was a perfectly reasonable question, he figured, for a line next to the man ordered to kill him. You'll be fine. You have your fairy godfather. This does not make me feel better. And that concludes our reading. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you... Check it out to see what is in store for Taylor and will or will Corentin not do his solemn duty as a huntsman to cut out Taylor's heart and deliver it to the Wicked Witch. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know and please follow my blog and my Facebook and all those happy little things. So thank you for joining me. Bye.